Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to our talk this afternoon by Anne Lindsay, hosted by the Canada Research Chair in um, History, Archives, and Indigenous Peoples and the uh, Manitoba Indigenous Tuberculosis History Project. Um, before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mary Jane McCallum here right away. Um, I just wanted to say a special welcome to uh, I see some former tuberculosis hospital patients and family members in the audience. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, and I also see a few elders in our audience. So thank you for logging in and joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mary Jane McCallum to make some opening comments. Uh, and then Anne will do her talk and we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, because our time is going to be a little limited for questions, I'm going to ask everybody to put your questions into the chat, um, and then Laura, our research assistant, and I will field the questions uh, for the time that we have for questions at the end. So, Dr. McCallum, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Nain Deshinsi, Mary Jane Logan McCallum, Wakni Nonji Ainalahi, Shokwiki in Winnipeg. I'm a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous People, History and Archives, and Professor of History at the University of Winnipeg. In, uh, I'm, today I'm in Treaty 1 Métis Territory. Um, I am located right across the mighty Red River uh, from St. John's Anglican Church and Park. And um, I'm also very close to the Health Sciences Centre which is um, a real junction for both the learning and practice of modern colonial medicine in our province and beyond. This is especially so uh, for the somewhat obscured history of what came to be termed in the 20th century as Indian TB. I'm fortunate to introduce Dr. Ann Lindsay, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Winnipeg with the Manitoba Indigenous Tuberculosis History Project. Dr. Lindsay is a settler scholar, an archivist, and a historian who has been for many years involved in identifying and honoring children buried in residential school cemeteries. Her accumulated knowledge is really unparalleled in Manitoba and Canada more broadly. To investigate this history, she's had to move between and patch together different sets of records of federal institutions, churches, individuals, local historical societies, and other organizations that have, until now, been treated separately by historians, if they've been the subject of a broader inquiry by historians um, about missing children at all. Following Anne's talk, if there's time, we'll have time for questions and discussion, and that will be chaired by Dr. Erin Millions, as she mentioned uh, just earlier. So she is the research director of the Manitoba Indigenous Tuberculosis Project and a historian and researcher with 20 years of experience or more. Dr. Millions runs the social media, public education, and research and archiving branches of this project and is a vital member of the project more generally, a member of a sort of logistics cell that the three of us have kind of created <clears throat> where we grapple with these questions of research methodology in a very difficult field. Uh, this is not, you know, this, this problem of research methods is not um, a small problem. Uh, especially in Indigenous health history generally, and especially during a global pandemic. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lindsay. Hello. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Mary Jane, for the fabulous introduction. So I think maybe um, I can just sort of jump into my presentation, if we could bring up the PowerPoint now. Um, and that'll hopefully leave us a little bit of time at the end for questions. <clears throat> and you go ahead and get started and I'll get this, this up for you. Okay. So from its earliest days, Indigenous communities and individuals have reached out to the Manitoba Indigenous Histories of Tuberculosis Project, looking for a guide that could help them to find out what's happened to family and community members, what's happened to their loved ones, their parents, brothers, their sisters, to the people who were sent to Indian hospitals and sanatoria in the years between the 1930s and the 1970s and never returned, 
Located in complex webs of religious business, municipal, provincial, and federal records creation and keeping, the work of finding answers to the unanswered questions family members have about where their loved ones may have died and where they are buried falls within a much larger ongoing picture of Indigenous peoples' lived experiences of segregation and separation in Canada. The process of building a guide to finding the graves of patients who died at Indian hospitals and sanatoria is both located in and speaks to this bigger picture. In her 2016 book, Separate Beds, A History of, the Indian, of Indian Hospitals in Canada, Maureen Lux explores the complex histories of Indian hospitals and sanatoria in the wider contexts of federal provincial tensions over areas of responsibility, the emergence of public health insurance, and the use of medicalization and the racialization of Indigenous people. In this book, Lux weaves together a complicated story of how these factors contributed to a segregated health care system in Canada that placed and even forced Indigenous patients into a racially separated stream of services that lagged far behind the care non-Indigenous patients could expect. Not coincidentally, these segregated patients were not only separated from their non-Indigenous contemporaries in the kind of care they received, they were also separated, often for long periods of time, from family, friends, and community, from home, and from the traditional records-keeping structures that had sustained them and their communities since time before memory. For many Indigenous people in Canada, segregated, separated, and substandard treatment has never been limited strictly to health care, nor has this separation and segregation ended with death. Today, Canadians are becoming increasingly aware of just how profoundly separate school desks, hospital beds, records keeping, and graves not only have been, but still are. In the spring of 2021, many Canadians were shocked by the news that over 200 mark, unmarked graves had been identified near the Kamloops Residential School. Disturbing accounts of ongoing and persistent issues in separate and profoundly unequal Indigenous education, funding, and concerns about child welfare serve as stark reminders that Indigenous experiences of segregation and separation are, to quote William Faulkner, not even past. But if government policy and practices relating to Indigenous education, health care, records keeping and burials have been and are both separating and separate, if their interventions disconnect families and communities, disrupting capacity as they run along segregated lines, separate from non-Indigenous systems, they were and are also deeply connected to and integrated with each other within the government systems that administer them. Even before the 1930s, First Nations and Inuit access to health care was controlled by Canada, often meted out frugally through its Indian agents and residential school principals. Beginning in the interwar years, as Canada began to develop a system of segregated Indian hospitals and sanatoria, adults arriving for treaty celebrations, the renewal of their relationship with the Crown, were more and more often met with TB surveys performed by provincial tuberculosis control entities on behalf of Canada. At the same time, Indigenous school children who fell ill were more and more often moved from segregated residential and day schools into segregated hospital beds, while children discharged from their segregated hospital beds could find themselves released into the segregated residential school system. The stories of the three little boys in this picture illustrate the webs of records and records keeping systems that family members face today when trying to trace the lives of their loved ones, looking for answers about um, what happened to those who never came home. The three little boys in this photograph, Eli Caribou, Albert Linklater, and Joseph Michelle, were all students at the Guy Hill or Sturgeon Landing Residential School when they were diagnosed with tuber tuberculosis. From the school, all three were eventually sent to the Denver Indian Hospital. Eli Caribou and Joseph Michelle's names appear on the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation's memorial list of children who died at residential schools. 
This image captioned trois tuberculous or three tuberculosis patients is from collections housed at the St. Boniface Historical Society. In this photograph, the three boys, Eli Caribou, Albert Linklater, and Joseph Michel, stand under a statue of the Virgin Mary, presumably at the Sturgeon Landing School. Go to the next slide, please. Erin, next slide. These children's stories are not unique. Driven by Indian Affairs policy that promoted hospital and sanatorium care, particularly for younger people, in the Sturgeon Landing School alone, many student deaths after 1940 occurred not in school, but in a hospital or sanatorium. And we'll go to the next slide. Although Indian Affairs required that pupils be examined by a doctor before being admitted to a residential school, we know that this process was never truly effective in preventing the spread of tuberculosis in these schools. In the case of the Guy or Sturgeon Landing Residential School, issues that contributed to the spread of illness included problems with overcrowding and inadequate medical screening, as the school was also being used to house unfunded students. Shortly before Eli Caribou was admitted, the principal was warned against admitting children who were not in treaty and who were therefore not only not grant earning pupils, they were also not medically examined before moving into the school's dormitories and classrooms. And one of the reasons that we've looked fairly closely with at the residential schools names is that it's a way in for us to test the systems that that we're developing for um, the guide that we're going to put out. And um, this, this is a problem that we run into is that children who weren't funded in the schools are not going to show up in the records in the same kind of way. So we could go to the next slide. Even funded students were not always screened before arriving at the school. There are 30 new pupils in the school and only two or three had been examined on the reserves, wrote the Sturgeon Landing School's doctor in 1945, in a story that underlines the complex connections between schools and hospitals at the time. There were about a half a dozen doubtful cases, bracket chest, but as the clinic was expected to come from Cumberland the next week, I decided to leave them until its arrival. In the end, the chest clinic never arrived and wrote the doctor, three of these cases are now at Clearwater Lake Sanatorium. I expect to have at least three more before spring. Placing his confidence in the school's nurse, the doctor concluded that he did not think that this placed the other students at unnecessary risk for as soon as symptoms develop, she will send them to the PAW. New slide. Of the three boys in the photograph we've just been looking at, we know the most about Eli Caribou's short life because his death is documented in the federal government's Indian Affairs Schools Files Deaths of Pupils records. During the 1930s, residential schools were required to inquire into and document deaths at their facilities. Some of these records have survived in the RG10 Schools Files series held at Library and Archives Canada. Covering a relatively brief period in the Indian residential school system's history, these files are far from complete records of deaths at the schools, even in the time frame they do cover. But for some families, these records can offer valuable insights into the lives and the deaths of loved ones. Next slide. According to the Sturgeon Landing School's admissions and discharges records, Eli Caribou, a child from Puktawagan, was admitted to the school on the 15th of August, 1940, at the age of five. His application for admission, which would have included his medical examination, does not seem to have survived. But because he was admitted as a grant earning student, policy at the time required that he should have passed a medical examination before or soon after he was admitted. And we'll go to the next slide. At the end of October 1942, the school's nurse realized that Eli was ill, so ill in fact that she put him to bed and provided what the school described as the usual care of TB cases out of sands, better food, rest, fresh air, etc., cod liver oil and cough mi mixture. 
The doctor arrived at the school on the 1st of December and Eli was transferred to St. Anthony's Hospital at the PAW by plane two days later. Residential school records suggest that up until this point when the school's administration transferred children out for medical care, the Sturgeon Landing School usually sent them to the hospital at the PAW. In the wake of the opening of the Denver Indian Hospital, now operated by the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba on behalf of Canada, in 1940, Canada began to, began to insist on placing Indigenous patients at Denver on the other side of the province. For families looking for records about someone they know attended school near the PAW, the rural municipality of St. Andrews might not be the first place they would look for records about a loved one. But Eli would not be the only student from Sturgeon Landing to make this trip. Next slide. Eli Caribou's trip across the province of Manitoba from his hospital bed at the PAW to the Nineveh Indian Hospital near Selkirk is consistent with the experiences of other residential schools experiences including that of Amos Blackhawk, a student patient from Northwestern Ontario who at Canada insisted on moving from the St. Boniface Sanatorium to Denver around the same time, despite the strong objections of both St. Boniface Sanatorium officials, where he was being cared for, and Catholic Church authorities. And if you'd like to know a bit more about that, APTN has um, got some material on their website, a fairly in-depth sort of investigation. And then the next slide. Despite his obvious poor health and medical expectations that he could not live much longer, on the 15th of December 1942, Eli Caribou was moved from the PAW to the Denver Indian Hospital. This child was admitted to Denver Hospital on December the 15th, 1942 with widespread active pulmonary tuberculosis, the report into his death noted. He lived somewhat longer than was expected and died April 24th, 1943. Next slide. Consistent with other Catholic patients who died at the Denver Indian Hospital, there's no indication that Eli Caribou was buried in the section of the Anglican St. Peter's Denver Church reserved for hospital patients, nor have we been able to find a record of his being buried at the PAW. Manitoba Vital Statistics holds a death registration record for Eli Car Caribou, albeit under the spelling C-A-R-A-B-O-U, a difference that can cause issues when doing database searches. We've ordered this death registration from Manitoba Vital Statistics about six weeks ago, but it's likely the record is not gonna arrive for some months. We're currently, um, we've been discussing this with the Archdiocese of Kuwait and La Paz, but they haven't been able to help us because um, the way that their records are set up, we would need to know which cemetery he's buried in. And what we're trying to do is figure out which cemetery he's buried in. So we're trying to work out how to get out of that loop. For now, we don't know where Eli Caribou and other Catholic patients at the Denver Indian Hospital, including Amos Blackhawk and Joseph Michelle, are buried. Next slide. Because of the unevenness of records keeping and existing gaps in many record sets, we know even less about Joseph Michelle's experiences than we do about Eli Caribou's. If the school had made a report about Joseph Michelle's death, it does not seem to have survived. His residential school record tells us that he was seven years old and apparently in good health when he entered the Sturgeon Landing School in 1942. And then we'll go to the next slide. So this is just an example of um, an application, a student's application, and it has the health information on the back there. And then the next slide. Because of the unevenness of records keeping, oops, sorry. He was still seven years old when he died at the Denver Indian Hospital in January of 1943, three months later. Next slide. As with Eli Caribou, Amos Blackhawk, and other Catholic patients who died at the Denver Indian Hospital during the time it was operated by the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba, we don't know where Joseph Michel was buried. 
As with Eli Caribou, Joseph Michelle's name is misspelled in the Manitoba Vital Statistics database, making it more difficult to call up if a researcher is not familiar with using these kinds of resources or if their internet access is limited. And then the next slide. Albert Linklater was eight years old when he entered the Sturgeon Landing School in the summer of 1940. Like Eli Caribou and Joseph Michel, he was apparently well when he was admitted to the school. Like Caribou and Michel, Albert Linklater soon fell ill with tuberculosis at the school and was sent in 1941 to the Denver Indian Hospital. There he remained until 1945. And the next slide. But unlike Caribou and Michelle, Albert Linklater did not die at Denver. Quarterly returns for the Sturgeon Landing School show that Linklater returned to the school on the 19th of April, 1945. Next slide. There he remained until 1947 when he was discharged on the 15th of August, the discharge form noting that he was of age, but also possibly that he had died the next month on the 21st of September at home. No entry has been found for him in the Manitoba Vital Statistics database, nor for Leo Soto, who might be the child referred to as passing away. The note in the school discharge form is ambiguous. And I'm not sure if, you're, uh, if you've got people's heads on the right side. It may be difficult if you move that around a little bit because... Um, the notation is actually on the right side of this form. So the next slide. The stories of the lives and deaths of these three boys are not unique, nor are they the only patients whose deaths in Indian hospitals and sanatoria are documented. Uh, in a wide range of documents spread over a number of quite different archives and records keeping systems. For patients, <clears throat> excuse me, for patients who entered Indian hospitals and sanatoria as adults, just as much as for those who were transferred there from schools as children, the bewildering range of places relevant records may be housed makes it difficult and sometimes even impossible for families to find information about the deaths and burials of loved ones. An article on the At The Forks website tells the story of one family who began searching for three of their daughters in the 1940s. It would take the persistence of three more generations before the three sisters' burial locations would be found. And that we found those only about two years ago. And then the next slide. Like education, Indigenous health care in Canada is, at its core, a federal responsibility, overseen and documented in federal records keeping systems unique to Indigenous people. The connections between and through the webs of bureaucracy that formed around and as a result of federal Indigenous tuberculosis and health care policy not only impact the families of former Indian hospital and sanatoria patients, whether those patients arrived as adults or as school children, they also complicate ongoing research into the final resting places of residential school students more generally. The same challenges that families faced in their personal quest for answers add to the burden of researchers working on residential schools, missing children and cemeteries projects. And these webs of bureaucracy are not limited to federal government systems. While a federal responsibility, aspects of Indigenous health care could be performed by provincial and other organizations, religious entities, and by businesses. Because of this, when searching for information about their loved ones, families of Indigenous tuberculosis patients often find themselves moving between a bewildering array of different systems and different privacy regimes without the kinds of resources and supports that non-Indigenous researchers and genealogists enjoy. Next slide. Sorry, I've gotten. For many years, the most consistent and central system of registering the births, marriages, and deaths of Indigenous people who fell under the Indian Act was the annuity pay system, 
1951, the federal government created a national register of every person they considered to be entitled to status under the Indian Act, a register that continues to be maintained by the department. While these records can be helpful for identifying when and sometimes even where an individual died, they can be difficult to access and the information that families mem members may receive from these registers can be vague. In Manitoba, Indian hospitals and some physicians appear to have begun to report deaths to Manitoba's Provincial Vital Statistics Agency beginning in about the 1930s, but vital statistics reporting from physicians, Indian agents, and schools during this period was, for the most part, unpredictable. During the 20th century, as federal and provincial records keeping systems began to intersect more often, and as Canada began to farm out health and particularly tuberculosis patient care to provincial entities, records relating to Indigenous patients of all ages were created and stored in a widening range of records management systems. In Manitoba, once Canada entered into an agreement with the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba to operate facilities at Brandon, Clearwater Lake, and Denver, Patient records were created and, retain, and are retained to varying degrees and under differing privacy and access regimes in both federal and provincial systems. Under operational agreements like the one in Manitoba, federal and provincial healthcare systems, provincial TB systems such as the Sanatorium Board in Manitoba and other bodies each created and maintained their own streams of patient records, while the records created in these streams could be stored in a number of different and sometimes intersecting spaces. Next slide. The Sanatorium Board of Manitoba's agreement beginning in the 1930s to operate a number of Indian hospitals and sanatoria in the province on behalf of the federal government marked a significant change in vital statistics records keeping and especially in deaths registrations in Manitoba, at least in terms of Indigenous deaths at these facilities. Perhaps because reporting deaths to Manitoba Vital Statistics was already standard operating procedure for the Sanatorium Board, or perhaps because the province saw Vital Statistics registrations as a revenue centre, patients who passed away at facilities operated by the Sanatorium Board are likely to have had their deaths registered with the province. This is often also the case with patients who were, for some reason, at a local hospital when they died. Under provincial legislation, vital statistics records of death are usually open 70 years after the death of the individual, which may be too early for some families. However, in some cases, family members might be able to request access to an individual's death record sooner than this. This can be an important resource for families searching for loved ones, especially if they're not certain where the person that they're looking for was when they died. In the next slide. As we've seen with the stories of Eli Caribou and Joseph Michel, it's not always easy to know where a patient may have passed away. If patients' records may have passed through and can reside in a range of places, patients themselves also moved physically from one facility to another and sometimes from an Indian hospital or sanatorium to some other local or provincial hospital. In 1999, David Stewart, the son of D.A. Stewart, many years the superintendent of the Manitoba Sanatorium at Nynette, wrote a history of the sanatorium. In this book, Stewart wrote that in the early 1960s, almost without warning, about 100 Inuit patients were airlifted from a sanatorium at Hamilton, Ontario, where they had been discontented and fractious. When they got back to a more northern environment, they settled quickly and became model patients until they were ready to go home. Officially, these roughly 100 Inuit patients had been transferred from Hamilton to Clearwater Lake as part of a repurposing of the Hamilton facility. And the next slide. Indigenous patients could be moved between facilities for a variety of reasons, sometimes willingly and sometimes against their wishes. Reasons for transfers could include availability of medical resources, overcrowding, facility closings, and apparently as a form of discipline. Patients too could request to be transferred, sometimes out of loneliness, hoping to move to a hospital where they knew other patients, or at least could be near someone who spoke their language, sometimes out of frustration with the hospital or its staff. 
I've been in the hospitals before at Mountain Sanatorium, Clearwater, Lake Sanatorium, Brandon Sanatorium, and in Winnipeg, wrote an Inuit patient named Shu in 1961, suggesting how fluid location could be for patients once they entered the Indigenous healthcare stream. It's a lot better in St. Boniface Sanatorium than it is in Brandon, wrote another patient. It is even better in Mountain San Hamilton than it is in Brandon. Next slide. In Manitoba, families who know or believe that the person they're searching for was sent to a facility operated by the Sanatorium Board of Manitoba may be able to request hospital records or information from the board's tuberculosis registry by making an access to information request through the province. Through the advocacy of the Manitoba Indigenous Histories of Tuberculosis Project, this process has become less onerous than it once was. At the same time, families may not always be aware that they have this option, and they may not find the answers they're looking for in the surviving records. If families know where a patient may have been buried, and especially if they know the faith community, the patient... <clears throat> Sorry, if the... If they know the faith community the patient might have been associated with, they may also be able to access information through sacramental and cemetery records, some cases funeral home records. These records are diverse, as are the rules surrounding access to them, while contact information can be difficult to find or out of date. In some cases, it's simply not clear who holds the specific sacramental or burial records. Let me go over to the next slide. Nor is it always easy to predict where an individual might be buried. Canada's policy and practice surrounding Indigenous deaths at Indian hospitals and sanatoria was no different than its policy and practice relating to the deaths of First Nations and Inuit people in any other context. This policy emphasized that the government would only pay for the funeral and burial of an Indigenous person if their family or band were not able to do so, and then would only pay an amount equal to or less than the municipal or provincial rate for the burial of an Indigent person in the place where the Indigenous person had passed away. If Canada was covering the cost of burial, the person's remains would only be returned to their home community for interment if doing so cost less than burial near the place of death. Although some families were able to pay for the burial of a loved one or even for the transportation of their remains home, they could only do this if they were aware of the person's death in time to make these arrangements. As with any other death of a community member, if a person could be buried at home on their own reserve, family could attend to their burial and to the process of grieving. At home, funerals and burial could form part of the social fabric that recorded, that archived the story of the person's life, their death, and their place of interment, as they did for indi individuals who died on or near the reserve. And that was a system that's worked since time before memory. But when a patient at an Indian hospital or sanatorium in Manitoba passed away, often far from home, many families and communities did not have this opportunity. Families already separated from their loved one might not hear of their death or might not hear of it in time to make burial arrangements. Some families did not have the resources to pay for the transportation of the patient's remains and their burial. As with government interventions in education and health care, deaths at Indian hospitals and sanatoria frequently disrupted community capacities in wide raising, ranging ways, including interfering with traditional ways of recording and remembering places of burial. Under this system, many patients remain both separated and segregated even after burial. Patients who died at Indian hospitals and sanatoria and whose remains were not returned home were often buried in dedicated sections of local cemeteries set aside specifically for deaths at these facilities. The administration of the records of these cemeteries could fall to religious entities, to businesses, to municipal or federal governments, or to some combination of these. Today, the existing records for these cemeteries range from detailed to missing. Next slide. 
In these cemeteries, graves might go unmarked or could be marked by inexpensive and potentially transited means. In the 1950s, when a grieving mother wanted to mark her child's grave located in a section of the cemetery on the Sioux Valley Reserve set aside for the burial of patients from the Brandon Sanatorium, the Indian agent expressed concern that a marker might detract from the existing plan of marking the graves with white crosses made out of wooden two by fours. The agent did, however, allow that the mother might have a plaque made that could be fitted onto the cross's arms. At the time of writing, uh, only uh, maybe half of these crosses remain. We're just in, in uh, conversation with Sioux Valley about this right now. They had a, a grass fire that went through there and of course that's de devastating to a wooden cross. A single stone marker stands out in the section of Brandon Municipal Cemetery <clears throat> set aside for Brandon Sanatorium patients who died between the opening of the facility and early 1950 when it appears burial shifted to a section of the cemetery on the Sioux Valley Reserve. A small pillow marker and a small wooden marker are the only other monuments in this section of burials. Near Clearwater Lake Indian Hospital, patients were buried in separate sections of the local riverside and lakeside cemeteries, and in a separate cemetery that is known as Mile 6, Big Eddy, a location identified by its position along the rail line. For the Osborne family, whose story of searching for the three sisters we were talking about just earlier that's on the, uh, at the Forks website, um, Research that has stretched over more than three generations into what has become a, the three aunties who all died of tuberculosis far from home, led them through federal, provincial, and religious archives and records. In the case of one of these three sisters, the research ended up with an unmarked grave in a section of a cemetery in the PAW reserved for Indigenous hospital patients. Anglican patients who died at the Denver Indian Hospital might be buried in a separate section of the cemetery at the nearby St. Peter's Denver Church, where today a single marker keeps watch. And while there is a plan for the Denver Cemetery, if there had been detailed plans for many of these cemeteries and cemetery sections, they can be difficult to locate. Next slide. Today, records management and records keeping systems perpetuate this history of separation and segregation. Located in non-Indigenous ways of knowing and remembering, outside of Indigenous management and control, many of the records of particular interest to Indigenous families looking for what has become to come of loved ones are less visible, less easily located than records of interest to non-Indigenous families. The long-standing and ongoing racialized divide that has characterized education, health care, and other aspects of welfare in Canada is also reflected in the mainstream genealogy resources families may turn to for help in finding out what happened to their loved ones. Many of these databases require access to high-speed internet, making them unavailable or difficult to use for people living outside of urban centres. Today, separate internet access adds to a long history of separate school desks, separate beds, and separate records keeping. Even with good internet access, modern genealogy databases such as Ancestry and various newspaper archives require comfort working in English. As well, these databases are not only more likely to contain information about non-Indigenous people than about Indigenous people, the algorithms and systems that underwrite them reflect and are more easily searched if looking for information about non-Indigenous families and communities. Cemetery transcriptions and online resources such as Find a Grave usually depend heavily on existing and legible cemetery markers, something many Indigenous patient graves lack. Even now, Indigenous families and communities looking for closure, wanting to find out what happened to their loved ones, continue to face issues created by separation and segregation. Next slide. For all of these reasons, Indigenous communities and individuals are reaching out to us, looking for information about how to find their loved ones. Located in complex webs of religious, business, municipal, provincial, and federal records, creation and keeping, this work is iterative and it's going to be ongoing. 
Our first task has been to outline the histories of the Indian hospitals and sanatoria where so many loved ones were sent, and to identify where these institutions' patients were buried throughout that history, as well as who, if anyone, holds the records needed to find those who are missing. Understanding patient movement between institutions and in and out of public hospitals is another important piece of this puzzle. Community how to tease information out of what can be a labyrinth of records set in a web of bureaucracy in a way that's not simply overwhelming is another challenge. At the end of the day, however, as with the not only related but completely enmeshed search for answers to what became of the residential school children who never made it home, working with families and communities to create a guide that will be useful to them in their research to find out where their loved ones are buried pushes back against the erasure that has characterized this story for far too long. To begin this process, we've developed a draft guide that highlights what are often the most promising first lines of research for most families or communities undertaking patient graves research. Breaking this information into general resources that may be helpful to any researchers and particularly to people who are not certain where the person they are searching for may have been sent and specific sections relating to particular hospitals, we're looking forward to mounting the guide on our new website and to updating the guide as we continue with our research and through feedback from users. And the next and last slide. Over time, we hope to be able to add to the information we have about probable burial sites and cemeteries for the various Indian hospitals and sanatoria, and when they were most likely to have been used for patient burials, as well as identifying new records, sources, and contacts. We also hope to be able to develop more in-depth guides for how to research when the usual research paths and resources do not offer any answers. At the same time, we're continuing to advocate for greater and more usable access to records for Indigenous families and communities across all sectors. In these ways, the Manitoba Indigenous Histories of Tuberculosis Pro Project hopes to enhance access to the knowledge of where family and community members who have passed away are buried, while supporting families and communities as they create and control their own ways of knowing and archiving this information. Thank you. Thank you for that, Anne. Um, I have to say that we are so lucky to have Anne join our project. She joined us uh, just in November because her skills as an archivist and a historian combined with her decades of working with this records make her uniquely positioned to be able to do this work. Um, I've tried to do it and I am not even in the same ballpark um, as Anne being able to um, use and access these records. And it also speaks to, you know, the level of expertise that's needed to figure out how to trace people who have gone missing. Um, it's not something that is easy for, you know, the family of a, of a loved one to just be able to, to do on their own. So thank you for that, Anne. Okay, so um, we will take some questions from the chat here. 